that their faith might not fail. Should Jesus now put to James and John the question he had once asked them? Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? They would not have ventured to answer, we are able. The disciples awakened at the voice of Jesus, but they hardly knew him. His face was so changed by anguish. Addressing Peter, Jesus said, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. The weakness of his disciples awakened the sympathy of Jesus. He feared that they would not be able to endure the test which would come upon them in his betrayal and death. He did not reprove them, but said, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter in temptation. Even in his great agony, he was seeking to excuse their weakness. The spirit truly is ready, he said, but the flesh is weak. Again, the Son of God was seized with superhuman agony, and fainting and exhausted, he staggered back to the place of his former struggle. His suffering was even greater than before. As the agony of soul came upon him, his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The cypress and palm trees were the silent witnesses of his anguish. From their leafy branches dropped heavy dew upon his stricken form, as if nature wept over its author, wrestling alone with the powers of darkness. A short time before, Jesus had stood like a mighty cedar, <clears throat> withstanding the storm of opposition that spent its fury upon him. Stubborn wills and hearts filled with malice and subtility had striven in vain to confuse and overpower him. He stood forth in divine majesty as the Son of God. Now he was like a reed, beaten and bent by the angry storm. He had approached the consummation of his work a conqueror, having at each step gained the victory over the powers of darkness. As one already glorified, he had claimed oneness with God, and on and faltering, unfaltering accents he had poured out his songs of praise. He had spoken to, to his disciples in words of courage and tenderness. Now had come the hour of the power of darkness. Now his voice was heard on the still evening air, not in tones of triumph, but full of human anguish. The words of the Savior were borne to the ears of the drowsy disciples, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. The first impulse of the disciples was to go to him, but he had bidden them tarry there, watching under prayer. When Jesus came to them, he found them still sleeping. Again, he had felt a longing for companionship, for some words from his disciples which would bring relief and break the spell of darkness that well nigh overpowered him, but their eyes were heavy. Neither wits they what to answer him. His presence aroused them. They saw his face marked with the bloody sweat of agony, and they were filled with fear. His anguish of mind they could not understand. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Turning away, Jesus sought again his retreat and fell prostrate, overcome by the horror of great darkness. The humanity of the Son of God trembled in that trying hour. He prayed not for his disciples that their fear that their faith may not, might not fail, but for his own tempted, agonized soul. The awful moment had come, that moment which was to decide the destiny of the world. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance. Christ might even now refuse to drink the cup, a portion to a guilty man. It was not yet too late. He might wipe the bloody sweat from his brow and leave man to perish in his iniquity. He might say, let the transgressor receive the penalty of his sin, and I will go back to my father. Will the Son of God drink the bitter cup of sin to save the guilty? The words fall trembling from the pale lips of Jesus, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. <clears throat> three times as he uttered that prayer, three times has humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's Redeemer. He sees that the transgressors of the law, if left to themselves, must perish. He sees the helplessness of man. He sees the power of sin. The woes of lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. He beholds its impending fate, and his decision is made. 
He will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts his baptism of blood, that through him perishing millions may gain everlasting life. He has left the courts of heaven, where all is purity, happiness, and glory, to save the one lost sheep, the one world that has fallen by transgression, and he will not turn from his mission. He will become the propitiation of a race that has willed to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission. If this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. So as we partake in the communion service today, let's remember what Christ did for each one of us and the struggles he went through and the battle between Satan and what he should do. This is a, a it's powerful. We only have a glimpse of knowledge of what he actually went through. So let us just remember this as we partake today. And, uh, and remember that Jesus is coming soon, like he promised us. This time I'm going to turn over the lesson time to um, Aaron Sarton. <clears throat> And happy Sabbath each every one of you. And uh, thank you, Brother Chris, for just sharing that passage. It's definitely such an inspiring account from the pen of inspiration of all that Jesus Christ went through. And it's powerful, to say the least. Well, amazingly, we've gotten through another quarter. It's the last lesson that uh, we were able to go through in this quarter, making friends for God. and. Um, I appreciate uh, Pastor Mark Friendly as being the primary author of this lesson study. I was all geared in truly how to reach out uh, and to affect, um, basically just, just being vessels for, for God to work through us to reach others as well for his glory. And so uh, a step in faith is our, our, our lesson. And you know, one of my favorite verses is, many verses on my favorite list, like adding on to, but Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7 is uh, chosen as the memory text or the key text for the lesson. And Maybe Sister Jean, would you read that for us? It's Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Amen. Thank you, Sister Jean. So we're going to reflect on, on that verse and what it means for us. and. And we just pray that as we begin our, our, our study that the Holy Spirit will guide us. And so let's, let's pray uh, before we begin. Can you bow your heads with me. Our right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to study your word together. We ask for the divine teacher, the Holy Spirit, to be present, to guide our thoughts, help us to understand truly what it means to have the mind of Christ within us. And we pray that that will spring forth um, a new and sincere desire to follow you with our whole heart, mind, and soul. We ask this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. So I don't know about you, but that, that verse, like, really, it catches me every time. But, you know, what it truly means to have the mind of Christ. Yes. 
Well, what was significant to me, the, the uh, King James is a little bit different, where the New King James says he coming in the likeness man. Mm -hmm. The King James says he found himself. You know, it's kind of like uh, <laughs> this was a, a new discovery almost. You know, as, I mean, he was a human, just like us. Uh, as, a, as a child, he didn't know more than any other child would know. But we're told as, as he went to Jerusalem that first time and saw the sacrifice and realized what that was all about, um, he realized what was happening and what his mission was, and he submitted to it. Even at that early age, he, sub he understood that he was the lamb and that he was going to die. And, uh, and he submitted to that. Amen. Thank you, Robin, for setting that tone. He came in the form of a servant. So all his life from, from the cradle to the cross was one of continued um, focus on the, the mission that he was sent for. And as he became to, as Robin, you alluded to, became to understand his mission growing up as a boy, the Bible says that he grew in wisdom and stature in favor of God and man. And then he realized in a more keen sense at Jerusalem, he was that Lamb of God. Neva. One time as I was reading this story in this Hour of Ages of Jesus as a child uh, going to Jerusalem to the Passover for the first time, and it says in there that he desired to be alone because he was working on this great question, the theme of who the lamb was as he saw the lamb being slain and realized the Holy Spirit was teaching him or the Father was teaching him, you know, who, what that meant for him. And he desired to be alone and I could just picture him going out of the city to be alone, to contemplate this theme. Perhaps he ended up in the Garden of Gethsemane, even then as a child, and gave himself, you know, at that time. I mean, that's just my own speculation. And by, as I, you know, grasp what this must have been like for him. And he wanted, to, he wanted to talk about that with his parents, but they were too busy, you know, socializing and all that goes on at a camp meeting or whatever. And think how, you know, how, what it must have been like for him. I just, uh, and thank you for um, reading that, uh, Chris. It was uh, a beautiful reminder again of that moment. Amen. On Sabbath afternoon's lesson, we also have a, uh, inspiring, another inspiring quote. There's just so many, but this one from the Desire of Ages, page 131. You can read along with me. It says, Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer before the throne of God. Then, as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember that Jesus left all of this for us that he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss. Then we shall cast our crowns at his feet and raise the song, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Taken from Revelation 5.12. So we don't even have the, really the faintest understanding of what Jesus gave up, what he was willing to, uh, to set aside as Philippians uh, chapter 2, as Gene read that, you know, it says that he made himself of no reputation or he emptied himself, if you look more at the original language, of all of his divinity, laid that aside. And do you realize that he was, there was a risk of maybe not fulfilling the mission? Was that, a, was that a real, was that a possibility? It was. And what would that have meant for the universe? I mean, it's just mind-boggling to think about that. But yet, he was willing to go forth every step of the way, so that even just one of the billions and billions of inhabitants of this planet might be saved, if, if that's what it would, what would have been the results of his sacrifice. But praise the Lord, we're told that there would be a, 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 um, a numberless company of redeemed. And so praise the Lord for 
him willing to, to go to the cross for the joy that was set before him. So let's just contemplate a little bit more about Jesus' self, Jesus's self-sacrifice and love and, and Sunday's lesson. Again, it goes back to Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And um, I don't know, I think we, we are... Yes, Chris, go ahead. Sorry. You know, in my humanity, I think of, you know, I mean, Christ gave up a lot more, but thinking, okay, I built my own place, bought land here, you know, and, and, and we, we establish our our little abode or our little kingdom here on this earth. And if one of our children, one of our family members is in so desperate need of our help, would be we be willing to give up everything, we, our job, our career that we may have spent, you know, for instance, you spent, you know, 12 years before you became, you know, basically full-fledged doctor. I mean, you know, it, it, that many years in, in education and, and land and, and home and everything, and, and maybe have to leave your family behind to go help somebody out. In our human, human thinking, that's what I think of basically what Christ did, but he did far more. But would we be willing to give up everything to go help this one person, uh, to, to help them wherever they need it? Good question, Tom. You know, not only did, uh, did Christ die to save mankind, but he came down to justify God and his position and to eradicate sin out of the universe. That's a very good point. I appreciate, Chris, your point as well. So go going on that, as far as we be willing to give up everything of value that we can, that we can tangibly see an experience in this life to go and to rescue someone in, in dire need. That's definitely a, a question we can ask ourselves. I, I know that maybe in, in our fallen humanity, that's, is that even possible? You know, apart from God so in this Holy Spirit working through our lives and giving us that, um, that continued flow of, of his grace and mercy to help with others. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of, maybe many of you know this, more of a famous a short story called The Gift of the Magi. Um, are you familiar with that? And it's written by an author with pen name O. Henry. But again, you know, know that the, the theme of that, these, uh, a couple, they're in, in dire poverty, but yet they have just one treasure each that is meaningful to them. That for their love for each other, they're willing to sacrifice um, that. Um, of course, they, again, you have the uh, surprise at, at the end that each one sacrificed all they had, and yet it was a reciprocal. <laughs> Thing. And so, again, the, uh, you know, the husband giving up his, his prized gold watch so he could buy this precious brush for his wife's beautiful long hair, and she sells her hair to buy a, a, a chain for the gold watch and so forth. They realize that the most important thing is that self-sacrifice and love for each other. That's just a, it pales in comparison, absolutely, but it's something that impresses us. We hear that short story, and we're like, wow, that's, that's real love. But the real love is, is the one that, um, that John, in John 3.16, he can't really fully express, for God so loved the world. I mean, I, you can add extra language in there. It just doesn't do it justice for what, again, it was the Father and the Son together uh, before eternity determining that this is what they would do should the need arise. And, of course, it did very soon after creation with Adam and Eve uh, being deceived by the, the serpent. So... Again, just being willing to, to give that up. And as Tom alluded to, not just to, to redeem us, to save us. You know, we are, a, we are a tiny speck in the universe, but a significant one in God's eyes. But yet God has this vast universe with, you know, billions and billions of galaxies and, you know, hundreds. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. But yet, he was willing to come to this planet, this quarantine planet. And we're, quarantine's kind of a... Uh, overused word these days, right? But essentially, we're still in that quarantine. But in the end, God's character will be vindicated throughout all the universe because of the love he's shown on our planet and all the unfallen beings throughout God's uh, universe will be, that will be the science and song throughout eternity. So it's amazing that we can just very faintly get a glimpse of it even now. So do you think then that 
As Jesus, that mind was in him, that self-sacrificing servant attitude all through his life from the beginning. I mean, you can imagine like what, a, what the situation was like in the home. Like parents and grandparents, would you like to have a child who's, who is, because he's so committed to the Father and doing his will that he's helpful, cheerful, encouraging? Um, but yet still had those same struggles at the same time. It's amazing. But he carried that attitude all, all throughout his life until he began his ministry, and then he comes to calling his disciples. After he's been baptized, he's endured the temptation of the wilderness, his ministry is beginning, and then he comes to these um, seasoned, experienced fishermen just doing their work and, and going into Monday's kind of uh, lesson or commitments call. But can you imagine... Um, so it's Peter and Andrew, they're men, you know, tending to their nets and fishing, and perhaps they've gotten a great haul of fish, and here comes the divine teacher. And what does he say to them? In Matthew 4, verses 18 through 20. Bonnie, would you like to read that for us? It's in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting the net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on their thence, he saw another two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, and in the ship with Zebedee his father bending their nets, and he called to them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Thank you, Bonnie. Is that a remarkable uh, passage there? And, of course, there's, you can read a lot more context and details, the desire of ages. But these fishermen, this is their trade. This is how they make their living and support their families. And this teacher comes, of course, divine teacher. Jesus comes and says to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And the Bible doesn't tell, tell that they, it took about you know, a few days to think about it, or it took a half an hour to kind of uh, weigh the pros and cons, you know, make a, a benefit analysis or, or anything like that, cost-benefit analysis. It says straightway they left their nets and followed him. And the same for uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Immediately, they left the ship and, and, their, and their father and followed him. So there was something about how Jesus called them that maybe gave them more of a reason to have faith in what Jesus said to them. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So they heard those words and they, they believed. And perhaps, I'm sure that they had heard about Jesus' teaching. Maybe they had heard him in person before. They knew something about that this, this is someone sent from God, and perhaps this is the Son of God. They had those seeds of faith in, in their minds, and Jesus, he uh, definitely brought those to germination, so to speak. You know, do you, does anyone else feel it's, it's remarkable that they just immediately left everything they knew, their value, so they left something of value. Jesus left something of infinite value. And I think that's what Jesus calls us to do. You know, we have to make a sacrifice to follow him. But any sacrifice we make in, in this world, we won't even remember it. By God's grace, he saves us in his kingdom, and we can bring as many as we can along with us. You know, everything else is going to fail in, in, in comparison. And maybe you can help me of remembering the... Spirit, Spirit Prophecy quote, where she has a vision that she's, you know, actually seeing heaven. Jesus is showing her um, all some of the glories, and she can't even describe it, but she does exclaim, you know, heaven is, sorry, um, heaven is cheap enough, right? And just thinking back of all that we've gone through, the struggles and trials, you're just gonna, it's gonna pale into comparison. So, I think it was 
Jesus having that mind of servant, like there was something about him, obviously, that was attractive, that would, would draw um, people to him in, 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 in the best sense. That he actually cared for them. He had this, this way about him that, that made that known. And so I think that it must have been remarkable to everyone else to see that these fishermen just going and leaving their nets and maybe it's a full catch and hey, that's, that's a lot of money. You just left. But I think for us, we have to have the experience with Jesus that we truly see the worth that he sees in us. You know, to, to, that's a remarkable thing as well. And another call it was the call of Matthew, the tax collector. And were tax collectors thought of highly in the Jewish economy? They were kind of in league with the Romans and they were kind of extortionists and like kept a certain percentage, cut off the top and put it in their pockets. And so they were loath. I mean, they were... Um, so for Jesus to come to Matthew, this is Matthew 9, verse 9, it's a similar uh, situation. You know, Matthew's at the seat of custom. He's in his kind of tax collector's booth or whatever. And Jesus comes and tells him, to follow him. And Matthew 9, 9 says, And Jesus passed forth from thence. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And Matthew went back home and thought about it a little bit more. No, it says, And he arose and followed him. So again, it's that response, that seed of faith being germinated and realizing that for Jesus to call you, it's for a divine purpose, divine mission. And you're going to be going on, and um, it's not going to be a comfortable experience on this earth. There's going to be struggles and trials, but the reward is so much greater than anything you can experience. Um, so I think God wants us to be thinking about the reward of the righteous, not that we deserve it in any way at all, but he wants us to realize that, you know, his kingdom is far surpassed anything this world has to offer. And I think that's just an amazing theme for contemplation. It's interesting, um, a lesson kind of looks at how many of the, the prominent um, authors of the Bible were called. And of course, we think of the New Testament, the apostle to the Gentiles. We think of the apostle Paul, formerly Saul. And looking at his call, so Tuesday's lesson kind of just talks about that. Any comments as we go forth? Yes, Bob. I think, I think that it was, it was, yes, Jesus gave the opportunity for the disciples to follow him. He invited them, as we are to do, but the Holy Spirit must have been at work in their hearts mm -hmm. to see beyond what Jesus was inviting them to do. They're, they're, they had to be responding to that. Something within them uh, touched them, and it wasn't, probably wasn't his words. It was, it was probably just that invitation gave the, the Holy Spirit the opportunity to work on them. I think that's a very good point, Bob. Sabine. Um, there is a difference, isn't there, between apostles and disciples. Um, Jesus called the apostles in a different way maybe than he calls us. It was a more drastic thing because much more was demanded of them in the long run. And um, they followed because, as Bob was saying, their heart was already seeking and leaning toward that direction. But do you understand what I'm trying to say? He doesn't tell everyone, follow me in the way he meant it then, literally. He does still today, but he says, go and sin no more to others. Is there um, a difference or what do you think? So I think there may be a difference there and, and just the circumstance that everyone is in. We all have our own experiences and God knows exactly what, what we need and what maybe invitation we'll re respond to in that way. So you're in, maybe uh, an example of maybe the, uh, the paralytic, you know, at the pool of Bethesda or, or Bethesda or even the, the man lowered by his friends through the roof. And Jesus says, arise and you know, walk. And he says, 
your sins are forgiven you as well. So when that, that man went and, and praised God as well. So in the response of the, of the disciples to Jesus' invitation, of course, they left everything immediately. But theirs was a, an education you know, ongoing. Through those three years of Jesus' ministry, he was working on, on their characters and knew their defects but of character, just as we all have our own as well. And Jesus knows them and is working in our hearts to, to refine us and purify us. But that, that faith that they showed, of course, at times, you know, that's not something that they, they could just go on that initial feeling or the initial, like, faith experience when they followed him. They had to renew that every day of talking with him and, and trust and confiding in him, basically, and being connected with him in a real way. And so for us as well, you know, there's times that we, we struggle. And, but Jesus doesn't cast us away for that. He calls us to arise, start walking for him, you know. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, uh, Sabine, or not. But is it interesting that he called, you know, he had a specific call for each, each individual person, and he knows just what we need. So, I mean, I like, I like the call of, of, of Saul, of Tarsus, basically. This, you know, persecutor of Christians whose reputation is spread all around, and he was a, a prized, you know, vessel of the Pharisees to kind of stamp out Christianity. But yeah, Jesus had a purpose for him. And who would have thought? I mean, if you were to, like, make your um, predictions of who would be, like, a great apostle and, and through the Holy Spirit have the success in reaching many souls and saving many, would you have chosen Saul? I mean, really? I mean, it's like he's persecuting the Christians. He didn't... He, rejected Christ, you know, in our estimation, we'd be like, why, why would, Lord, why would you choose him? But God is infinite in wisdom, and, and all of his ways are best, and um, it's just an amazing, powerful story that someone in Satan's camp doing his work, yet God is much more stronger than that, and is able to, to redeem someone, plucked out of the fire, and now he's this uh, committed person for God. And you know you can apply that to uh, <clears throat> to our loved ones or to people who have separated themselves from God. It seems like they're going in the direction that, that can't be changed. But God is merciful, and God, Amen. through the Holy Spirit, can touch those hearts. Yes. Amen. In a heartbeat. Tim. Yeah. Look what Ananias had to say when God said, "I need you to go see Saul." <laughs> he goes, are you sure? You know this man is coming after us. <laughs> Figure of speech. <laughs> yeah, so he, he does let us question yeah, what he wants us to do, but he's going to show us why he wants us to do it. Well, one thing too, though, is that Saul was so dedicated in what he was doing that Christ knew that if he turned to go his way, he would be dedicated. That's just how he was. We know that throughout his life, that he was, he, was, he was tenacious in his endeavor to do what he believed was right. All right, God used that quality for, for the kingdom's purpose. So Tim, you alluded to Ananias, and you know, the lesson just brings, uh, brings us to Acts chapter 9 and 10 through 20, maybe a longer section there. Let me just go ahead and read... Um, maybe 10 through 16 here. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord saith unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. But behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So with that in mind, it's, and again, this is after, so Saul's experience with 
seeing Jesus on the road to Damascus as well. And, and maybe in, in kind of a quick order, he goes from um, going bent on persecuting the Christians as his commitment, and that was the object of his tenacity, and yet he sees, sees Jesus. And, of course, his, his sight is taken away for a time, but he realizes all that he's been doing in the name of following God was, was wrong. And so it's amazing how he, he has that moment of humility, and it takes being blind, <laughs> maybe this sight taken away to get to that point, but it's just amazing. And God is so good that he's, I mean, he's given each one of us an, an experience, a testimony to bear for his glory. And uh, Revelation says that, talking about overcoming the dragon, and they overcame him by the word of their testimony, the blood of the lamb by the word of their testimony. And so just imagine, you know, even the, you know, the first beginnings of eternity, you know, by God's grace, we're all there. And we're able to share our story with, with you know, whatever planet we're going to. Like, you know, Sister Jean, what planet are you going to this, this week, you know? And what galaxy? Uh, I, I mean, it's just an amazing thing to tell our testimony. And that would be our science and song, how Jesus plucked us out of the fire, brought us out of darkness, his marvelous light. And can you imagine all the unfallen beings just wanting to gather around and hear this story? Of course, maybe they've, they've, had, maybe they've had access to God the Father and, and to the angels all this time. But to hear firsthand witnesses coming from this planet Earth, this quarantine planet, of how Jesus, you know, how his love changed you, changed your, your life, and now you're here to tell the testimony. That's why, if you think about it, we, we say it often that, you know, Jesus would, if just one person were to accept his his sacrifice on the cross on their behalf, that it would have been worth it. And that's true. And I, I'm reminded of a, a short, you know, those amazing facts, you know, sermon series, little booklets. There was one Joe Cruz sermon, so it came from, from one of his sermons about this concept and uh, the worth of one soul redeemed. Basically, if you kind of calculated all of the human beings who had born and lived in the, on this world, you know, billions and billions, who knows that the number, and what's their accumulated lifespan? You know, maybe before the flood, much longer. But there's, it's going to be a finite number, correct? However big that number may seem. With an, one soul redeemed is going to experience eternal life. Eternity, never ending. And on and on, that one person would be able to provide more praise and honor and glory to God than the accumulated hundreds of billions. You, you see what the point is. So that's in the context of eternity, which we, we cannot fathom. So that's just another amazing thought that, you know, that Jesus was willing to, to, to lay that aside if need be. If he would have been eternally, eternally separated from the Father, if for whatever reason he didn't fulfill his mission, or if he just decided, you know, I, I don't think it's worth it, then obviously it would have been lost. But then the universe would not have had that eternal example of true love. And that is, that is the real reason, as Tom alluded to, God's character is, is glorified. And what's more than if Jesus would have just returned to heaven? It's an amazing thing. The so demands of love in Wednesday's lesson. We know that just as we alluded to, Disciples, when they were called, they had this maybe enthusiasm, and it was real. I think it was sincere. They wanted to follow Jesus, and more and more he was working on their characters. But we see in, in Peter especially, the Bible kind of brings out his story more, as he was more uh, outspoken perhaps, and he was sure of his commitment to the Lord, that, you know, that he would follow him even to death. But Jesus knew his character, obviously, and told him the reality that you know, before Jesus would be on the cross. He would have denied him three times. And so afterwards, you can imagine that maybe the other disciples, even as Jesus appears after his resurrection, that they're maybe apprehensive. Peter, didn't he deny you three times? And so in John 21, we, we get Jesus actually maybe reinstating Peter. John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. 
I've got a little more time right now. It's about 10.30. We're without a, a clock up there. Let's see. Who can we ask to read? Maybe Tim. Would you read John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19? So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lamb. He said to him again a second time, Simon, P Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. To 19? Uh, yes. Okay. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you gird yourself and walked where you wish. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Just thinking about that, you know, we have at the onset of Jesus calling his disciples, and Peter was among those who read in, in Matthew, that they followed, at the call to follow him, they, they left everything. And now, after that experience of three and a half years, you get Jesus kind of repeating that same call from the very beginning, follow me. Of course, a lot's happened in that time. But I, I think it's especially poignant that Jesus, and we have this account that Jesus, after Peter's denial, which it was not just a denial. I mean, it was, it was very bad. And we've all done very bad thing, things. We've sinned and fallen short of God's glory. They denied Christ in that hour of, of his suffering and the trial. But he did with cursing, too. So, obviously, that's, that's bad in God's eyes. It's not the unpardonable sin, though, because Jesus, Peter repented. His heart was broken. He was broken, and so God could now build him up and strengthen him. But he gives him the opportunity in front of all the other disciples to show his love for his Lord. And he's not boasting. He's not making some bold prediction anymore. He's just telling Jesus that he loves him. And, you know, the lesson does bring out there's, there's some nuances on, in the original language and the words for love. Tim? Well, that one verse, uh, I think it was 18. He said, Peter said, God, Jesus, you know that I love that you, I love you. Yeah. So he's not even like resting on his own understanding. Yes. Yeah. So Jesus, he does initially. I guess the word for love. There's different uh, different words. We're familiar with phileo, like brotherly love. Maybe human love amongst brethren. And then agape is more of a, the divine origin love. So apparently, in, in the first time that Jesus asks us in that question, he's using that agape love. And of course, Peter, when he responds, he doesn't use agape, like assuming that he has that divine self-sacrificing love within him. He uses the phileo as well. And... Um, Maybe this, is, maybe this is more than just the teacher's comments, but I guess the author just brings out that fact that Jesus' final um, question to him uses phileo again. So it's almost recognizing that Jesus kind of looking to Peter like, Peter, I know that you love me. I know that you, maybe you don't have this divine love within you yet, but if you continue to submit to me, I will develop that in you, right? Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so... It's kind of a nuance there that was quite interesting, Bob. I think that, uh, that Peter 
thought that he loved the way that Jesus wanted him to. But, and he was kind of put out, I think. I, I would have been if he keep asking me the same question. But, but he, he, when he really was converted, then he had what Jesus wanted him to have. I don't think he had it right then. He thought he did. He thought he, he did, and yes. He's, and he's kind of put out by saying, well, duh, <laughs> you, you know I do. Why, why do you just keep asking me? That's how I've always taken it. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's different layers there. And of course, Peter denied him three times. And so three times he's got an opportunity to be reinstated. I thank God that the Lord doesn't see us as we are, but as we will be when he's finished with us. Amen. As our Redeemer. And to me, that's an ongoing process. And what he was saying to Peter in, in my experiences, when you're young, there was one level of your commitment to me. But as you matured, you will come to that place where another will tell you what to do and where to go. And so I pray that each and every one of us continue to grow in Christ, to grow up into him. And he made that possible. It is not unattainable. He showed us the way. Walk ye in it. Amen. Amen. Eugene and Arlene. The thought occurred to me as I read these last words of Jesus asking Peter three times, do you love me? And he affirms to him that, yes, I do love you. You know I love you. Why do you keep, in Peter's mind, was why do you keep asking me? You know me. You know the inside of me. And then Jesus says, what's going to happen to him in the end? Are you still going to love me, Peter? Facing what now you know, how you're going to die? Will that love that you profess now continue to the end? And will our love for Jesus continue to whatever happens to us in the end? Amen. Just as we began with Philippians chapter 2, we're in there, but kind of going further in the context, starting in verse 12. And this is the Apostle Paul, as we talked about, Saul changed into Paul, saying in verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So if you stop there, you kind of wonder, like, how can we work our own salvation? We can't save ourselves. This fear and trembling is basically is calling us to humble dependence upon God. Because verse 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's the inner workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So I don't know if anyone of you maybe sometimes lack the will to... I'd be God in every, every, in every uh, instance, you know. Our wills are sometimes strong, but God works in us to give us that desire. Yes, Julie. I think, uh, going back to Peter, the last two words on what was read was, follow me. Jesus was giving him the key to success, to overcome what he now knew would happen to him. Follow me. And that's how we all will have success in following him. Amen. Just the simple instructions, which are so profound. And could it be then, as, as God's word has creative power, you know, even though it might be, we I mean, have all scriptures given by inspiration, and that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit in writing the scriptures. And so Paul 
giving inspiration to write what he wrote, saying, let, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Is there some similarities to like the first command as you open your book and open the Bible and turn to Genesis, let there be light? The creative power within that, that as we submit and surrender and give God permission to work on our lives, this is going to be the result, the mind of Christ within us and all that that represents. That's the, so that's the amazing thought. And as each one of you has, has shared in your comments, I just pray that we would yield to God, yield to the Holy Spirit, so that the mind of Christ can be within each one of us and we can truly follow him so that he can make us fishers of men and women and everyone that will choose to receive salvation. Uh, and may his soon return be hastened. And so I'm thankful that we have the opportunity to, to all partake in the Lord's Supper and the foot washing and... We're going to, um, to end our Sabbath school time right now. We have a little bit of time for an uh, intermission. It's just 1042 right now, but why don't we close with a word of prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, we thank you so much for this amazing privilege to gather together and study your word, being led by your Holy Spirit, the divine teacher. Lord, we realize that our lives fall so short of your ideal for us, but yet you don't leave us there. You don't cast us away. As we come to you in faith, you help us to grow daily in grace and the knowledge of your truth. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue your work within us, that you've said that you, you will complete the good work begun in each one of us. Please give us the will to do of your good pleasure and help us to truly be meditating and thinking upon what it truly means to have the mind of Christ. And may that be accomplished in each one of our lives, to have self-sacrificing love for one another, and that the world would know that you are God, you're all-powerful, and you can change lives. We thank you, Lord, for being with us, and please go um, and direct every aspect of the service we're about to enter into. We ask this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Thank you, everyone.